To introduce the book, the first thing that we come across in the first uh, verse of the book is the word Paul. And that reminds us that Paul is the author of the book of Romans. He is uh, pretty much universally recognized as the author. There's little uh, dispute uh, of his authorship. Um, even those who are critical of the Bible recognize that this indeed is authentic and is Paul. Um, it's kind of interesting to look at Paul and uh, his history. Um, we can first think about his name for a moment. Uh, he, of course, he wasn't always named Paul. He was also named Saul as he grew up and became a Pharisee and uh, then went on to persecute the church. He was Saul. And in the book of Acts, if you go through that book, you'll find that for the beginning part of any description of him, his name was Saul, uh, even to the point and after of his conversion, when he's on the road to Damascus and Jesus uh, confronts him there and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Um, so Jesus confronts Saul and Saul is converted at that moment and enters into the service of the Lord Jesus, which uh, Paul will uh, speak of briefly here uh, as a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel. It's all kind of a reflection of that confrontation that he had with Jesus on the road to Damascus. But uh, he was named Saul. Uh, after his conversion, he continued with the name Saul. He appears to the uh, churches in Judea, and they're nervous about him. He stands before Peter and James, uh, the pillars of the church, and gives witness to his understanding of the gospel. He's still Saul at that point. Um, he goes to Antioch, and there with Barnabas, uh, Barnabas actually brings him to Antioch, and there's a church there uh, established, and he begins to serve there in the preaching of the word. Uh, and then finally, Paul begin, or Saul begins on his missionary journey into uh, the island of Crete, and there on in the city of Paphos, there in, on the island, uh, he comes across a fellow by the name of Sergius Paulus. And uh, Paulus would be perhaps uh, Paul's first convert, at least in terms of what we see in Scripture. Um, and so some speculate maybe uh, Sergius Paulus named him Paul in honor of his work of uh, grace in his life. Uh, or perhaps Paul honored Sergius Paulus by taking on his name for himself. Um, I don't, I'm not persuaded by that. I don't think that that's probably true, but it is interesting that uh, at, at this moment, it's in Acts 13, I believe, verse 9, um, that uh, Luke records that uh, from this point on, Saul, verse 9 says, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, and then he addresses a Jewish magician who was creating problems for Paul, but um, very uh, uh, easily, softly, um, without any explanation, the name of Saul becomes Paul. And from this point on, in Acts 13, verse 9, he is only known as Paul, the Apostle. And that coincides with his Gentile ministry as he goes off into Asia Minor, off into Macedonia, and so forth. And finally, uh, with an interest to in coming to Rome, uh, which will be of importance to us, um, from that point on, he's known as Paul. So it's kind of curious to know where this came about. And um, a couple of commentators, John Murray doesn't talk about that, but um, a couple of other commentators... Uh, do, and the suggestion is that uh, Paul had two names. It was not unusual for people in that day to have two names, a, if you will, a Jewish name and a Gentile name. And Paul was raised in Tarsus, um, which was a, 
more of a Gentile city, not in Israel or Palestine. Uh, he had natural Roman citizenship, we know from the book of Acts. So um, it may be that he was, he was given two names, a Jewish name, Saul, but also a Roman name, Paul. Um, a name that would be more acceptable among the Gentiles. Um, that would coincide with the beginning of his ministry there among Gentiles, so uh, that's certainly a possibility. But um, it is interesting that his name is changed there without really any explanation or uh, discussion about that. Um, so Paul is the author, and uh, when did he write this letter to the church at Rome? Well, um, clearly it's before he actually came to Rome. Uh, Rome itself was formed as a church uh, through the witness of uh, Christian people who migrated to Rome. You might recall that Pentecost, uh, as the Apostle Peter preached, there were people from all around the world who had gathered into Jerusalem there at that time, including people from Rome. And the... the uh, uh, business of uh, uh, economics and so forth brought people tra traveling and trade from one city to the next and uh, so people would be going to Rome and traveling back and forth and uh, so it, it may be that some of these early believers under Peter's ministry uh, went to Rome returned home to Rome from the uh, celebration of Pentecost went back to Rome and shared the gospel with people there, and a, a congregation began to form there in Rome. Uh, Paul had certainly not been there to start the church, and Peter, uh, we don't have any indication that he was there either to start the church. Um, so that seems to be the most likely explanation for the beginnings of the church there in Rome. Uh, it's composed of likely both Jews and Gentiles, clearly there are Jewish people there in Rome, uh, and Paul, in his letter, uh, enters into a dialogue with them. He, in fact, he is arguing with uh, the Jewish point of view uh, with regard to works righteousness and the uh, salvation of the Jew by observing the works of the law and so forth. So um, there's a Jewish community there in Rome, and Paul is uh, addressing them in this letter uh, and as well, certainly addressing the Jewish Christians to strengthen them in their understanding of the gospel so that they would be preserved from the, the falsehoods coming from the uh, Jewish synagogues. Um, so the, the more than likely were Jewish believers, Christians there in Rome, uh, but the majority probably were Gentiles, um, uh, people who were... Not, uh, not Jewish, but uh, of the nations of the world. Now, Gentile is a big uh, term that includes uh, Romans and Greeks and people from India and China. Anybody who's not a, a Jewish person is a Gentile. And so there were these uh, folks uh, there in Rome who were believers in Christ, and uh, but probably also had been challenged to understand the nature of salvation and particularly how they are made right with God. So uh, Paul is going to address that. Paul probably writes this on his third missionary journey. Uh, you recall it from the book of Acts that uh, Paul was at a point towards the end of that third missionary journey when he was going to travel to Jerusalem and he had uh, gifts. He had uh, um, a contribution to make to the Christians there in Jerusalem and Judea because of a famine that was developing there. And so uh, he, he was going to be leaving Asia Minor, Macedonia in particular, and head uh, by boat to Caesarea Philippi and then down towards uh, Jerusalem uh, to minister to the uh, needs of the saints. So the Gentile churches in Asia Minor uh, the the uh, Philippians, the uh, Ephesians, and so forth, uh, brought a collection together, put it in uh, Paul's hands, and uh, 
uh, he sent, he, he, he went and headed, he was going to head towards uh, Jerusalem. Now, he spent about three months in Corinth uh, just prior to going to Jerusalem, and so it's uh, understood by most commentators that Paul wrote this letter from the city of Corinth um, while he was ministering there. Um, he sends this letter off to Rome. There would be people traveling from the city of Corinth to Rome. Um, uh, among them, I think, are Phoebe and Gaius. Uh, so there was some overlap there between the two. Um, so he, he wrote the letter from the city of Rome, or excuse me, from the city of Corinth, uh, before heading towards Jerusalem. And you recall when he got to Jerusalem, um, the crowds there were quite incensed by this apostle to the Gentiles being in their midst and uh, a riot formed and he was rescued by the Roman soldiers and eventually he made his appeal to Rome and so Paul would travel to Rome but not in the way that he anticipated. He would be arriving as a prisoner um, rather than voluntarily going to Rome as a missionary without any encumbrances. Um, at any rate, um, so Paul writes from the city of Corinth, and the time period is, is roughly, commentators differ between 55 and 58 AD. Uh, you, um, in this particular introduction to uh, the letter, you'll see that they come to the conclusion that Paul wrote his letter to Rome in AD 57. They don't explain why they think that, but uh, th that's close enough. So um, that's about the that's time. That's what the ESV says too, 57. Yes. ESV. But Murray takes 55. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there are different points of view on that. Um, some later uh, towards 58. Um, it's kind of hard, I think, to really pin that down uh, one way or the other. But uh, that's not so important to our understanding of the gospel itself. So that's a little bit of the background. The, the, the other thing we want to do is look at how the letter is organized and um, the different ways of doing that. I find uh, a lot of outlines are very complicated. There are multiple points and then sub points and so forth and it's pretty hard to uh, keep all that straight in your mind. I, I think though that there's a basic order to the epistles of Paul that you can observe in nearly all of them. I uh, would say that it's patterned after the covenant and the way the covenant is formed in the Old Testament. Um, I don't want to get into a long conversation about that, but uh, just very briefly, to use the standards of English literature, uh, you have an introduction, the body of the letter, and then the conclusion, right? And in the, intro in the body of the letter, or the introduction will, will tell you something about what the letter is going to be about. Then the body explains that, uh, might answer objections along the way, uh, give illustrations, motivations, that sort of thing. And then the conclusion comes up where you summarize what you've covered and uh, um, perhaps add a, a, an interesting story to drive the, the main point home, something like that. Um, I would say the introduction to Paul's letter is the first chapter, verses 1 through 17. That's where he introduces the major themes of the book, uh, and especially the theme of the book itself is presented in verses 16 and 17, where he writes, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So this is the theme that he wants to unpack, explore, develop, help the, the, the uh, congregation in Rome to understand. And uh, so uh, with that, um, I think uh, chapter 1 verse 18 all the way through the end of chapter 11, uh, Paul is developing the idea of, our, of the salvation of all who believe 
through faith in Jesus Christ. The salvation of, of sinners uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. And he's going to uh, develop that through these chapters. Um, the first, second half of chapter 1 and all through chapter 2 and the first half of chapter 3 up to verse 20. Verse 20. Now, Paul talks about the wrath of God on uh, mankind for their sin, both Jew and Gentile. Uh, they've broken God's law in one form or fashion or another, uh, either through the law as written on the heart in the case of the Gentiles, or the law as given in special revelation through the law of Moses. One way or the other, um, the, uh, let me just take that off for now, you can see me. One way or the other, uh, they've broken God's law. And so uh, Paul is going to take us through this whole idea of the wrath of God for sin and the, the judgment that comes on those who are wicked and therefore set up the need for salvation. Unless we have an understanding of the wrath of God for sin and our, uh, the fact that we are guilty before him, we've broken his law and we face his condemnation, uh, unless we understand that, we're not going to appreciate what it means to be saved. What do you need to be saved from if everything is basically okay? If you're basically good and uh, you can do good things, what do you need to be saved for? So uh, Paul explains that for us. And then in the latter half of chapter 3, verse 21 and following, he talks to us about God's provision of righteousness. So we've got a problem of being unrighteous. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven, Paul says in the 18th verse, against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So, mankind is unrighteous. They do not have a personal righteousness, and so God will step in and provide them with a righteousness. It's the righteousness of God <clears throat> uh, that is given to all those who believe. So it's through faith uh, that God gives this righteousness to uh, those whom he sovereignly chooses, as will become apparent later on. But uh, then we are justified by faith. Our, our salvation is uh, through faith in Christ. And Paul develops that uh, in chapter 4. Uh, in chapter 5, he, he continues to talk about our salvation, really through the end of chapter 5, he's talking about how God has saved us from our sins. He set up Christ as the second Adam, and uh, we have the gift of his righteousness given to us, such that we're saved. Uh, Adam brought sin and death into the world. Christ brought righteousness and life to us, to his people. Um, so uh, that gets us through an explanation of our salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. Uh, in chapter 6, Paul begins to answer an objection. Well, if you're saved by faith and not by good works, then doesn't that mean you can live as you please? And of course, Paul makes the argument that, uh, no, when we are joined to Christ, we now live a sanctified life. Uh, so we're justified by faith. We're also sanctified by faith. We are united to Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And that includes a transformation of our lives. Um, and so Paul talks about our sanctification in chapters 6 and 7 and into chapter 8. Um, towards the end of that chapter, he talks about, uh, chapter 8, verse 18, he talks about uh, the glorification of God's people. Um, and their security in Christ. So he's answered the objection with regard to whether justification by faith produces a life of uh, lawlessness and wickedness. And the answer is no, not at all. We have a new heart. We're changed. We have the Spirit indwelling us. We are empowered by the resurrection of Christ uh, to live a new life and to obey God. It's not without struggle and uh, so forth, but we are liberated from the power of sin in our lives. In chapter nine, chapters 9 through 11, Paul deals with this whole idea of the power of God for salvation. Remember, the, the theme was, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, to the Greek. And so 
it's very much that issue of the power of the gospel that comes into view here in uh, chapter 9 uh, when uh, Paul confronts the, the thought that there are uh, many Jewish people who have not received the gospel. In chapter 9, verse 6, he says, It's not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. And so the power of, gospel, of the gospel is defended here in terms of the salvation of the Jewish people. God intends only to save a remnant of the Jews. Um, the elect within the outwardly chosen people of God. And so God's word has not failed. Uh, God, God's word operates according to his electing purpose. And so in chapters 9, uh, 10, and into 11, Paul talks about Israel and the work of the gospel in Israel uh, by re in relationship to God's work among the Gentiles. So, this uh, finishes God or Paul's exposition of our salvation through uh, faith in Christ. We are, it's salvation for all who believe, Jew and Gentile, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile. Uh, and that's what uh, Paul's been discussing. Then chapter 12 um, begins another section. Now, I talked about from English... Uh, your studies in English composition long ago, you've got the, the introduction, the body uh, of your letter, and then the conclusion. Uh, I, I prefer to look at the Gospels, or excuse me, the, the epistles of Paul from the perspective of the covenant. Paul was raised in the law. He's taught very clearly about that. And uh, God's word seems to follow a pattern as you uh, pursue it. And so in chapters... 1 verse 18 through chapter the end of chapter 11 you have the history of God's relationship with his people uh, the history of redemption how God has provided us with salvation and so it's very much an exposition of the theology of what God has done for us in Christ then in chapter 12 we come to what you might call the the stipulations of God's law the response in view of what God has done for us in Christ how should we then live and here you have a, an exhortation to godly living, as Paul gives it here in the 12th chapter. Um, so he says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, okay, just uh, in, in view of all that we've considered so far, the mercies of God revealed to us in Christ, therefore I urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And he'll go on and itemize the various forms of godly conduct that ought to mark the life of a believer, uh, particularly emphasizing the importance of love, by which the law is summarized. And then in chapter 13, he begins to, I think, uh, provide motivations and encouragements and warnings uh, in terms of uh, this gospel message. And he speaks first about uh, submitting to those who are in authority over us. He talks about the, the, the approach of the, the day of judgment, uh, and whether we should be judging the weak uh, uh, for the, their uh, weak consciences, chapter 14, um, again, the, the idea of rewards, uh, blessings, uh, punishments, uh, curses, these are the kinds of things that come into view with regard to the, the judgment of the Lord that is to come. And so we get through chapters 13 and 14 and on into chapter 15 with these kinds of things until the conclusion comes to us, it seems to me, at chapter 15, verse 14, where Paul begins to wrap everything up uh, fit from chapter 15, verse 14, to the very end of the book, uh, he, with all the greetings that he sends forth to different people. Paul begins to kind of recapture what he had to say at the very beginning of the book and uh, just make some final comments along the way. And so he says, I myself am convinced, my brothers, 
that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. I've written to you quite boldly on some points. So it's clearly a summary type of statement here. He's reviewing all that he's said thus far. I've written to you quite boldly on some points, as if to remind you of them again, because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, with a priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God, so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Um, that picks up something of what he had to say in the first chapter, um, verses 8 and following, where he talks about how their faith has been reported around the world, um, and uh, his prayers for them. And then he says that, um, I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong, uh, and so forth. He says, I plan to come to them and have a harvest among you, just as I've had among all the among the other Gentiles. I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. So Paul is kind of recapturing what he was saying at the opening of the epistle and bringing some of these points home uh, along the way. Um, I glory in Christ Jesus and my service to God, and so forth. So, um, that's how I see the, the chapter, and you can follow that pattern in Paul's writings. There's uh, the introduction with the themes presented. There is the exposition of doctrine. Uh, next, uh, the, the work of God for our salvation in Christ. Then there is the ethics that flow out of that. Because God has done this for us in Christ, therefore how should we then live? And so there is a, an exhortation at the center or towards the end of the epistle uh, to tell us what God expects of us in view of what has been said already. Then there are motivations, incentives, rewards, punishments, that sort of thing, uh, judgments, uh, that follow with that to motivate and incentivize God's people to perform those good works, to live for God, to accept and believe in the gospel as it's been exegeted in the first part of the book. And finally, there's that conclusion that uh, brings it all together, perhaps on a succinct point, an exhortation, uh, and then uh, greetings to different folks and uh, perhaps as well, uh, what should be done with the letter in terms of who it should be sent to next. So uh, that's kind of a, a, a brief overview of the book itself, the letter itself. Um, Rich, is yeah. Romans part of the canon of the gospel? Uh, it, it's not what we might call a gospel like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, it's mm -hmm. an epistle, a letter by Paul to the churches. It's a pastoral epistle. Often Paul writes these letters to congregations to address a specific need within that church. And so uh, the church at Rome, they needed to be taught the gospel of Christ and its basics, how we are justified by grace through faith alone in, the, in Christ. And so Paul addresses that issue there. To the Galatians, there's another problem. To the Corinthians, a, a, another problem. You know, the, these letters are like sermons addressed to uh, congregations with their particular view or particular problems in mind. Uh, Corinth had all kinds of immorality and Paul had to address all these kinds of things. Corinth was very much captivated by the gifts of the Spirit and so Paul had to channel their enthusiasm and focus on uh, the edification of God's Word. Uh, so uh, Paul addresses congregations and meets their particular need. But in the providence of God, those kinds of needs are the kinds of things that churches have even today. And so Paul's letters are meaningful to us. We certainly need to understand that the nature of the gospel message and uh, the nature of the gospel itself. Uh, the gospel is good news. That's just the, the meaning of the word itself. And uh, Paul gives us the good news of salvation through Christ, by believing in Him, uh, we are saved from the wrath to come. And uh, so this is how we uh, receive God's gift of salvation.
So this is an epistle. There are Gospels, epistles. There's the, the history of the book of Acts. Uh, there are other uh, general epistles that you have at the end. Uh, Hebrews, James, Peter, John. And then you have the Apocalypse, the Revelation of St. John, uh, which is of a, a different character altogether. That's the kind of literature that we have in the New Testament. Um, any questions or thoughts as we've gotten this far? I met a young lad on YouTube, not met, but saw his video. Mm -hmm. And is that dispensation, dispensationalism if you believe that the rapture is coming? Yes, that is dispensationalism, the view that um, uh, God operates in different ways during different dispensations. Uh, so that uh, in uh, the time of Adam and Eve and the fall, there was a dispensation there. There's the, the time of Noah. There's the time of Abraham and the fathers, uh, David and the kingdom. And then, you know, each time, or I, I skipped Moses there, but each time there's a, a way that God provides for people to get right with him that fails and something else is uh, given. Uh, Moses gives the law and uh, the kingdom is offered. Jesus comes into the world to offer the kingdom to Israel. They reject it, and so in dispensationalism, there's a new dispensation at that point, the church. And with this dispensation of the church, um, you still have God's purpose for national Israel, and then you have the church, and they're two separate bodies of the people of God, Israel on the one hand and the church on the other. And towards the end of history, in dispensationalism, you have the idea of a rapture of the church where they're taken up out of the world. And then there's a persecution of those who remain, the Jews. And there's a great turning to Christ among the Jews. Uh, so you got a Jewish church, a Gentile church uh, operating differently. And then you have uh, the conclusion of this period of tribulation uh, where uh, Christ comes and sets up his millennial kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. And so you have this period where Jesus is reigning with his saints, the, the, the uh, Gentiles come down upon the earth with the Jews, and they're living in the world, uh, governing the rest of the nations and so forth. So, I don't know. Excuse me, gotta go. Oh, this is dead fall. I can hear his dad's voice. Yeah. You heard him groaning. I don't know if he fell or not. Yeah. Does that help your answer, uh, Justin? Give you an answer? Um, yes, I, it's coming together in small amounts. So, the, the pro uh, there are a couple of problems with dispensationalism. I come out of that. I don't know that Rich ever lived under dispensationalism, but I did growing up as a child until I was in, in college. And, and uh, one of the problems is that it makes, uh, it separates the church into Jew and Gentiles. Paul says that there's not to be that kind of separation. There's neither Jew or Gentile. They're all, we're all one in Christ and we all receive the same blessings as we believe in Jesus as our Savior. So that's an error, a very serious error of dispensationalism. It even, it even claims that, um, that, God, that the Jews are still God's people in a sense in which that's not true. They rejected Christ, and uh, right now they are apostate. They are not believers for the most part, although there are individual Jews coming to know the Lord. And there's a belief that the Jews as a whole nation are going to come and believe in Jesus. And, and that's debated among biblical scholars as to how many Jews will be saved, you know, in, in, in the future to come. But I saw that's, that's one Indians of the problems. That Master Shaw, I saw some Indians at uh, LPC that were really 
alien to some of the teachings we were accustomed to. And they were asking all these questions about, you know, their, the Hindu and how that has to pertain to the gospel. And they, they had some questions that really shocked me, like, would Jesus come back as a, as a, a person or something like that? And is, uh, will we live again on the planet and stuff like that? So I wonder if, if all the different religions are starting to come around to hear the gospel and that, that was shocking, but I, I heard it. Well, there's only one gospel. That's the gospel of the Bible. Uh, I would be very skeptical about Hindus or Buddhists or Muslims or anybody, you know, uh, what they were teaching. Uh, and all you would have to sit down and discuss it and, and find out, you know, what, where are they coming from and <laughs> what are I they? I wonder if they would come to our church. On Lawton Avenue, there's a Presbyterian church in Philly that's all Indian. Mm -hmm. Like maybe former Hindus or something, but the one at LPC had a bunch of like Hindu Indians asking the, their pastor, the LPC pastor, questions about how can they change from being Hindu type of thing. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Hey, uh, Justin. Hi. Going going back to your original question about dispensationalism, I, th I think Rick, uh, Rick uh, do you think it's fair to say that dispensationalism refers to how God dispenses his grace? So, so it's like, how does God give, what is the matter and how and to whom does God give grace? So God gives grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. So if you're thinking that, if a person is thinking that God dispenses grace by some works their way into heaven, that's not grace. So he doesn't do it that way. That's not how he dispenses grace through our works. So that's what dispens dispensationalism refers to, dispensing how, how grace is given out. That, would you say that's correct, Rick? Well, the word dispensationalism is talking about a period of time, not uh -huh. necessarily a dispension of grace itself. Okay. It's more or less, most dispensationalists believe in seven dispensations. Um, in the Garden of Eden, there's innocence. Man, you know, was, was not... Uh, Obviously, in his glorified state, he could fall. But you know, there was innocence in the, in the sense that uh, he didn't know sin and so forth until, of course, the fall came. You know, and then there's a, another period of, of uh, dispensations from uh, in, uh, in the Noah's time, uh, the dispensation of the flood and and so forth. I for, there are different names for them. I forget them. Yeah. But yeah, I guess I'm not used to the church hear. period is a dispensation, and uh, and, and all. And okay. So so there's that. Um, I've never heard, I've never heard a dispensationalist talk about dispensing grace, as a okay. And all, although they they might be there may be those so. Uh, you know, I don't yeah. know everything about dispensationalism, but uh, yeah. the well, thank, biggest thank issue you is the that, separate the Old Testament. Yeah. yeah, the biggest problem is we separate the Old Testament from the New Testament and all, and so that um, believers, uh, uh, the Jews are still the people of God. You know, I, the, <laughs> the church is special but the church is not uh, they definitely separate Jews from Gentiles so there's a a woke atmosphere he asked you know between the between the two and then there's mm -hmm. the there's the concern about the millennium too and 
what I think the millennium of a, being a thousand years, they take it literally based on uh, mm -hmm. Revelation 20. And, um, but, they, but there's things about the millennium that they don't believe and all. And one of the things is we, we believe in uh, Reformed Christians is that we've been under Jesus' reign since he ascended into heaven and was enthroned uh, at the right hand of God. Jesus has been ruling, according to 1 Corinthians 15, ever since he went into heaven. Uh, and he's going to turn the kingdom over to the Father once all of everything uh, comes together under his reign at when he uh, brings believers into the kingdom after the judgment and so forth. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So dispensationalism, and there's two or three other things that, if they came to my mind, I probably could expound on them. But um, a lot of Reformed Christians consider it heresy. Dispensationalism is a heresy because mm -hmm. of uh, the way that uh, they see the church and the Jews and and other things. And their dispensations, like uh, under the time of Moses, is the dispensation of law. And therefore, by keeping the law, you were saved, uh, uh, they believe. And so, uh, you know, so there's that, that obvious uh, disparity between the true gospel and salvation by works. You know, if you believe in that dispensation of law um, in the Old Testament. So, yeah, there's a real, um, sadly, it's the prevailing opinion in evangelical Christianity today that we have these dispensations and that uh, Jesus is going to return at any moment and in this, uh, actually, it's a, a secret coming. <laughs> which makes me think more of the Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists than uh, evangelical Christians. But uh, the rapture is only for the Gentiles, for the church. It's not for, you know, the, it, it's, it makes there be a second, uh, second coming of Jesus, which really isn't his coming in the sense of coming to the earth uh, and so forth but instead uh, I mean we could say that I wouldn't say there isn't a rapture in the sense that um, there is no rapture at all at the end of history there will be a rapture there will be uh, believers and unbelievers <laughs> raptured because the judgment will come when Jesus returns. So there is a sense in which we will, you know, those who are living will be raptured and those who are in heaven believing in Jesus will meet will meet the Lord in the air, the scripture says. So, But that's at the end of history, not, uh, uh, you know, that it will be coming uh, with a a seven-year tribulation that will occur afterwards and the kind of things that the dispensationalists teach. Pastor Shaw, did you hear that Trump wants to build the dome that Israel has to protect America and its citizens from nuclear? Rick, if I may, I just want to throw in that First of all, thank you for the clarification. I interrupt you, Justin. Please pick. I just wanted to say to Rick, thank you for the clarification. I was accustomed to the definition of a meaning to this. I never knew dispensation as a definition of a period of time. But thank you very much. Yeah, that's what it really is. Dispensation is, is a distinct period of time. Like okay, thank you. The time in the garden, or the time of Noah, or the time of 
the law of Moses or the, or the, gotcha. Davidic, or the Davidic time of, of David being the king and there's the Davidic uh, covenant and all. We believe in certain covenants as we that God made a covenant with Adam and Eve. He made a covenant with Noah. Made a covenant with uh, Abraham and Moses and David and all. But they're all under the covenant of grace. They're all gracious covenants. They are not a covenant of works, or um, as the as dispensationalists tend to believe. Mary. So. There's there's a book by O. Palmer Robinson, I believe, that I read. Robertson. 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 Yeah, uh, Robertson. Called, called the um, the Israel of God. Right. Which really, I thought, I thought it was helpful. Um, it's not very long, um, but it explains how there's no difference between Jew and Gentile in the church, and he really makes a really strong case for that. Yeah, um, Rich can give you information about getting that book, Justin, if you'd be interested in reading I've read the book, too. Yeah, I can type it in my notes here. It's uh, the Israel of God by O. Palmer Robertson. Not an easy read, so Tamara, I commend you on getting through that book. <laughs> yeah, you know, I oh. in reading that, I felt like he could have... He, that book probably could have been at least twice as long. He he didn't really delve into some things. And of course, there's lots of cross references. But regardless, and I'm not sure I um, necessarily comprehended everything. But I I found it really helpful. That's good. That's why the purpose of the book. You got the purpose of the book. Yeah. Have we got any questions on Romans and what? I know Rich wanted to get up through verse 16 or 17. He's not going to make that, <laughs> obviously, because it's after 11 o'clock. But um, any questions about the background that he gave us um, or the first verse? I don't think we got any farther than that other than the outline. Actually, the salutation or the... Um, introduction of the book goes all the way to where he said verses 16 and 17 or actually verse 15 the theme of the book is developed in verses 16 and 17 um, and then he did in Paul's, the name of Paul that he went from Saul to Paul okay yeah I, I, I gotta study that again but this is, I'm, one, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to study under you and Rich. Um, this is really eye-opening for me. And uh, I have some of your notes here from the study we've been doing, but uh, I guess there's a lot more to keep. I better get a three-ring binder. <laughs> <laughs> when we get together on Friday, uh, Justin, I'll, I'm going to bring my complete notes and everything and and uh, you and I can sit down and see whether or not I've, I don't know if I've given you everything that I should have given you so you may be without some things I have the first day and just recently we had another pack but I, I might not okay. have the ones from the yeah I think there's maybe a couple in between that I should give you alright how's dad uh, he's okay um, he had a fall, um, pretty good sized fall. He tripped down a couple of steps leading to the family room uh, next to the garage door there, if you're familiar with my house. And uh, mm -hmm. he was on his backside with his head back up against the door and um, when I found him. And so I keep telling him not to go down to the family room. <laughs> It's an opportunity for a fall, but he just continues to do it. Anyway, um, I checked him out. Nothing broken. No obvious signs of harm in any way. So he's able to move everything around and stand up and walk. So 
I think he's okay. I just gave him some ibuprofen, Advil, to uh, help with pain. And uh, he had to use the bathroom too, so maybe he was wandering around looking for the bathroom. He forgets where the bathroom is now, you know, and mm -hmm. doesn't know where that is at. And so, anyway, thank you. Well, we've been uh, discussing Justin's question about dispensationalism and doing a little bit more to bring clarity to that. Okay, good. I, I actually consider it a heresy myself. It is. Um, it breaks up the unity of God's grace into different dispensations. It doesn't see the unity of the covenant and the coming of Christ. It divides the church between Jew and Gentile. Um, I, I think it, it's a heresy. And Was the Reformation anything to do with that? Um, that that was a modern event, but was that uh, a time of God dispensing? Well, in the Reformed tradition, we'll talk about various epochs in time where God's work advances. It's not a different administration of God's grace as you have in a dispensation where um, the, the uh, plan fundamentally changes from one period to the next. Uh, there are different epochs in time. So that there is an advance during the time from Abraham to the time of Moses and an advance from Moses to David and certainly a great advance when Christ comes into the world. So God's revelation continues to unfold and build and grow and develop. But it's all one harmonious message, that the way of salvation is through the Christ and, and through Him alone. Now, following the, the revelation of God's Word, you have the history of the church and the tradition of the church, if you will, as we seek to uncover and understand and explore the riches of God's revelation and the history of redemption. So you have you know, great old theologians, uh, Irenaeus, Tertullian, uh, um, Chrysostom, uh, Augustine, uh, and going on to uh, the period of the Reformation with Luther and Calvin and Swingley and Turretin, John Owen, many others. Um, you have epochs in time where there is uh, advance in our understanding of the gospel, sometimes tremendous advances, and sometimes there are like ages where there's kind of a, a retrograde, a decline, a, a darkness settles in over the church. And so um, the time of the Reformation was a time when uh, it, it comes at the end of a, a dark age. Uh, in the life of the church and there is a renewing of the grace of the gospel and so forth. And I think today we are in more of a period of decline uh, overall. Um, th there's many things to rejoice in and to see God at work in the world today um, but it does seem like the um, the enemy is quite strong and powerful in this day. So.